Our next speaker is uh, Devon Tong, um, uh, head of uh, Sustainable Salons New Zealand. Uh, in 2015, um, Paul Fresca co-founded an uh, innovative circular economy program called Sustainable Salons Australia. Uh, SSA collects up to 95% uh, of a salon's waste and repurposes it for environmental and community benefit. Following runaway success in Australia, Sustainable Salons has now brought its unique model to New Zealand. Uh, a warm welcome for Devon Tong. Well, um, here we are. Hello. Testing. <laughs> um, Paul obviously can't be here today, so he sends his apologies. He really wanted to be here. Uh, he had a death in the family, so obviously I think we can let him off that. Um, but yeah, I'm taking his place. So I hope I do his talk justice. I was only told two days ago, so uh, very much dropped in the deep end. Is anyone worried about the carpet now? <laughs> uh, I'm like, I need to get out of here. Um, <laughs> So a little background on sustainable salons. Uh, yeah, we were created in 2015. Everyone thinks these things happen overnight, but the actual business model uh, put together took about 10 years. We've only been truly operating for three years in Australia. It was founded by uh, Paul Frasca. We call him the Fro. As you can see, he's got an amazing head of hair there, and he is a hairdresser, so he knows the industry well. The lovely lady next to him is Evelina Sirocco. Um, it's his partner. She uh, studied environmental sustainability, specialising in fashion. So it's only natural that these two hit it off uh, as soon as they met. Um, so Paul's one of those overachievers you love to love. What I mean by that is he started sweeping floors as an apprentice in a salon at the age of 11. Uh, by 19, he owned the salon. And, um, and then within the first year, he was uh, recognised for his skill set. So he actually got nominated for award. Um, up in Europe, quite a prestigious award. So he flew up to accept the award, supposed to go for two weeks, ended up staying for seven years. Um, that was in Amsterdam. Uh, you can only imagine why he stayed. Um, one of the reasons was that he actually met Evelina as well at a house party. And um, yeah, fast forward, um, probably coming to the end of the visa, he doesn't really talk about that much, but uh, at the end of seven years, he decided to come back to Australia and he really wanted to look to create, you know, the sustain sustainable salon environment. He knew what was coming out of his salon, but he didn't necessarily know what, whether all salons were the same. So him and Evelyn spent many nights talking about this and what would a sustainable salon look like. Um, launched in 2015, um, we started with one salon. We could probably only order around about 50% of the salon waste at that stage. Um, we're up to 95% now, so salons who are under our program can go to bed at night knowing that 95% of their waste is taken care of, um, which is a really good thing. Um, April this year, launched in New Zealand. I actually met Paul in a salon about four years ago and I was so inspired by what he was doing. I, um, I took his number and uh, I heard through the grapevine that they're looking at launching in New Zealand and I was actually on a contract up in Europe uh, just before Christmas and um, I contacted him and said, are you ready to go? And lucky for me, he was. Um, so yeah, we haven't been operating long in New Zealand, so I can't stress enough, we, a lot of the stats you'll see today is data collected from Australia. We've got three years of it now. Um, by December this year, we'll have a pretty good picture of what's going on in New Zealand and what's going on inside our salons. Um, so a lot of the stats you'll see are from Australia. So this is Paul, the man, the real man. Um, they decided to travel around the whole of Australia before they kicked off um, with their program because they really wanted to get a feel for the whole country um, and the different types of salon, salons. Um, they ended up auditing 180 salons and they quickly identified that yeah, there is a lot of different stuff coming out of salons. So some salons have beauty attached. Um, dog groomers, for example, started to pop up. Um, it's crazy what they are, the businesses and side businesses and salon spaces now, uh, a lot of beauty. Um, as well. Um, good to see he had some time to go fishing, um, quite a decent size. Um, and yeah, it gave them time, four months exactly, to really um, nut it out and think. Um, sometimes the best ideas come when we're in that space, as you know, um, and so it was a great opportunity. They spent $8,000 on gasoline. He really wanted an electric but didn't have one at the time. Um, and yeah, it's a massive country, so that's why it took so long. So how did they audit? It's really simple. We still get a lot of our data by, um, 
by weighing. It really is the best way to sort of audit rubbish. So um, here he is cruising around his 180 salons um, doing the audit and uh, yeah, even through New Zealand now we're already starting to get some good stats. Um, just the foil alone it equates to about 50% of the waste coming out of the salon space um, and in New Zealand I believe from our numbers we're look, looking like we generate around about 400,000 kgs per year of foil alone coming out of New Zealand salons. It's massive and it's going into landfill or was going into landfill. Um, 150,000 kgs of, of colour tubes, so quite a lot. Um, this is a little slide, uh, it's a, it was created by the Australian Government and um, uh, the Australian Hairdressing Council just to kind of highlight what Paul does and um, rather than me uh, going on I'll, I'll let them speak, speak for him. Hi, I'm Eco Paul and thinking salon sustainability is what I do. As a hairdresser, I've always wondered about what happens to all that salon waste and does it have to go to landfill? Well, I found out that nothing needs to go to landfill and that everything can have a second life. For example, hair. Did you know that every year in Australia we landfill over 400,000 kilos of hair and that hair can be used to clean up oil spills or used for compost to grow food? Salon metals can all be reused too. Did you know that we landfill over 1.5 million kilos of metals each year? Aluminium foil, colour tubes and hairspray bottles are all infinitely recyclable. Even the wires from your straightening and blow dryers have copper. This can be sold for cash. Oh, and what about plastic? Did you know all plastics, even plastic bags, are recyclable and that they can be made into hundreds of amazing products such as fences, furniture, skateboards, clothes, you name it, it can probably be made from recycled plastic. I also found out that chemical waste, like leftover colour or even straightening solution, even shampoo, can be recycled back into water. A much better alternative to being put down the drains which can end up in our precious oceans. It's time we take action today by turning your salon's waste into our future resources. Be part of a sustainable salon future. Support the Australian Hairdressing Council and together we can make salon waste history. So obviously here we don't have to support the Australian Hairdressing Council, which is good, but uh, we are uh, partnering with the New Zealand Hairdressing Association. They've already included us in a few of their events, so it's really great that they're, they're behind this and on board. So what do sustainable salons do? Um, slide says it all. Uh, we rescue up to 95% of salon resources from landfill. Um, we find repurposing solutions that benefit the environment and give back to the community. All while we reward the salon um, for offer, and we actually offer them um, better sustainable minded product alternatives. So when you become a sustainable salon, we actually um, give you a form of rewards points, kind of like flybys, but actually true value points. So it doesn't take you 35,000 points to get a toaster. Um, and a lot of the things within that store are, are, are things that will help better their environment. So biodegradable gloves that break down in a year and a half um, to three years instead of a couple of hundred there, hundred thousand, um, and so forth, biodegradable bags, um, foil, and uh, everything like that. So the cost of running the salon goes down, which is great. Um, what do they say? Never work with kids, um, pets, or technology. There you go. So what does sustainable si salons look like? This is our environment. Um, I believe there's probably a few people in waste management in the room. Would you ever have imagined that you'd have such excitement from people hopping out of your bins and wanting to get photos with your bins? It's pretty cool. Um, so we've really developed um, our bins to, I guess we've tried to make them look sexy because let's face it, the environment that they're working within is, is, quite, is beauty, it is beautiful. And um, we wanted that, our, our bin service to reflect that. Um, so these are some of our salons, some of our network. Um, as you can see, we do take pets, providing they're clean. Um, it's a joke, but uh, no, I actually will take a couple. <laughs> um, and then this is our depot up in Queensland, for example. Um, we've partnered with the Endeavour Foundation because this really resonated with us. Um, the Endeavour Foundation help um, put people in work who have uh, special needs. So our whole depot is run by the Endeavour Foundation up in Queensland, um, which is just amazing. Um, Bruce, for example, on the right there, he got interviewed recently and asked why he liked working with us at Sustainable Salons. 
And he said he liked it because he got to go on the van and he gets paid. <laughs> That's right. So it's so amazing to see these, these guys come out of their shell and uh, have a real sense of purpose and pride um, as being treated equal, which they should be. Um, we are looking to re-emulate that here in New Zealand. Obviously, we're still quite new, but we've already identified some companies that can help us in that space here um, on the North Shore. So what do we do with all the rubbish, all the waste streams? So we get quite good money for the aluminium. We get good money for paper. Um, normally, it would just go to landfill. Well, we sell it because it's valuable, right? It's a resource. Um, to put that in perspective, um, in the three years we've been running in Australia, we've generated uh, enough funds from sold waste uh, to feed 48,000 people. Massive, huh? That was just going into landfill otherwise. So um, one dollar equates to two meals under the Oz Harvest program. This is Ronnie here. She founded Oz Harvest. If you don't know what Oz Harvest is, they simply take food from uh, supermarkets that's end of life and would have gone to landfill and rescue it and repurpose it so that someone um, in need or homeless can actually have a meal, which is just amazing. I believe in France it's illegal to throw out food. Is that not correct? Um, you know, maybe we should, we should adopt some of that because um, it's, it's such a great thing that these guys um, do every day. They're a non-for-profit. Um, that's why we like to support them. It's, it's really hard yakka, as you know, being a non-for-profit. Um, and it's just unreal how much they do with what they have. They've now got stores opening up where you can actually go in and purchase um, what you think something's worth. So if there's an apple out of date by one day, you know, if you think it's worth 10 cents, you can pay 10 cents, which is just wicked. Um, so in New Zealand, all the funds we generate stay in New Zealand. They go to Kiwi Harvest. Um, so we're very transparent about that. 100% of the funds that we collect um, from the sale of, of, of rubbish, we, we give to Office Harvest. Um, just to let you know, we've probably around about 40 now under the program since April, um, and we've probably generated enough money from waste to feed about 1,000 Kiwis. So it adds up real quick. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the end of the year of having the stats for New Zealand and sharing that with you maybe next year. Um, because as you know, as they touched on earlier in the piece, um, we aren't that tidy. <laughs> we generate a lot of waste. And in fact, I heard an amazing stat the other day. If, we were, if, if every human generated as much waste as we do, we'd need 3.5 planets to sustain us, which is pretty scary. Um, so, people, planet, profit. We're a commercial enterprise. If we we're a non-for-profit, we wouldn't work. Um, so what does people, planet and profit look like in our business model? So this is one example, local community initiatives. Uh, it's called Do Something Day. We're looking to bring that here next year. It's simply that. It's, if you have a skill set, like a lot of our salons do, you know, they've got a, an, an amazing skill. We just ask them to come donate uh, an hour of their time to, to cut here for those people in need. So it's not always about throwing money at a wall. Um, you, you know, people have skill sets every day. Um, that could be really useful. So Do Something Day is one of those. We put it out throughout our network if they want to come down and cut here for an hour. Um, I'm looking forward to doing one of those here um, very shortly. And um, yeah, it's just a great thing to be involved with. So prior to sustainable salons, there's a couple of manufacturers that make medical grade wigs for kids with alopecia and cancer. Um, up until we came along, kids were waiting three to five years for a medical grade wig. Some were dying before they even got their wig, which is really quite sad. Um, we now cultivate the ponytails, so we have the salon send them in to us. We collect them, um, make sure they're of the right grade and end up in the right place. We 100% of our ponytails only go to medical grade wigs. So since we've been doing that, in three years, we've collected over 28,000 ponytails for kids with alopecia and cancer. What does that mean? That means about 1,256 wigs have been made and no kids wait anymore for wigs. It's just, I just love this story and the salons love it and it's, it's so infectious. Um, so yeah, pretty cool. Um, one of the largest actually manufacturers is actually here in New Zealand in Dunedin, which is good to know. We've we actually got so much here now, 7.1 tonnes of it, we're stockpiling it. What's, um, what's that manufacturer? You know? What's that? Dunedin, what's the manufacturer? <laughs> I don't know the name of them, but um, yeah. Again, a lot of the questions you'll probably ask me today are probably for Paul. Um, I'm very new to this, um, but by all means, we will get them answered. Maybe just get my email after. 
Um, so when you become a sustainable salon, this is kind of like our, our seal of approval. Uh, these are a lot of the resources that we deal with uh, in any given day. Um, and yeah, everything from the, the branding to the marketing, we try and make it as clear as possible. So how do we do it? We've got depots. <coughs> Dealing with waste is no easy way. Uh, again, I know there's a lot of, uh, there's a few people in waste in the room. It's hands on. It's, um, it's physical. Um, and I know that China said no, but I, to our waste recently, but I believe it's actually just because it's not um, processed properly. So it needs to be clean, it needs to be sorted properly. Um, so that's really effectively what we do. Our clients, we go in and train them um, for a good hour, teach them probably more about rubbish than they cared to know, but we think it's important because they help us educate the consumers, um, and that's why we reward them. So depots, infrastructure, um, drivers, these are some of our drivers in Australia, I can tell because our ones in New Zealand are better looking. Um, yeah, but these guys are really good at, at, at um, yeah, I believe they empty the bins under arm as well. Um, but I won't go into that. Um, so yeah, there's no easy way, this is it. Uh, we use smaller vehicles like vans because um, it works well for our model because um, we are very specialist so we're not getting the massive amounts of curbside that you would in your normal curbside um, waste management. So what do we do that's unique? Chemicals, one thing. Up until we came along, chemical just pretty much went down the drain in a salon. To put that in perspective, to see one of those bins there, I've got salons in Auckland that fill that in two weeks with chemical. It's a lot. So what have we been doing for the last 50 years? It's been going down the drain. So we've found a model that um, gives us the access to collect the chemical. Um, they're pretty much just old paint containers, as you can see. Um, we send them to a, a recycling plant and they basically neutralise it and turn it back into sort of uh, a commercial grade grey water. Um, so I know, I think I saw Fullerton Hogan in the room, they've obviously started to deal with plastics with roads, I know they did the first one in Christchurch Airport which is awesome to see. Um, so when you see the trucks cruising along watering the road down to keep the dust down, that's industrial grey water. So we've found a solution for it. 95, 98% uh, of the chemical waste that we collect is actually water. So we, we bring out the 98%, it's pretty much put in like a high velocity spinner that spins out all the chemical and you're left with that 2% um, toxic waste which we deal with accordingly. Usually it's burnt off um, in the right way. Um, so yeah, that's chemical. Uh, plastics obviously, we, it's just about making sure they end up with the right in the right place uh, and not, not in the oceans and making sure that they go to our correct partners. So we take softs, we take hards and we've got multiple, um, uh, multiple sectors and companies that deal with that waste. Again, that's out of my field, that's more questions for Paul as to who they are, but um, welcome to answer that for you via email. So another cool thing, people, planet, profit. What do we do with our profits? A lot of the money goes, 10% of it goes into um, research and development and uh, this is what I really get off on. I really love this side of things. Quite often we get suggestions from our salons and we do take them on board to help solve problems. One I'm dealing with at the moment is wax. Waxing strips, wax. Um, it's a real toughie. Um, there's a few alternatives like sugar wax and so forth, but it's a personal one of mine that I'm working on. Here, 7.1 tonnes of it. Um, we've developed uh, the Hair Boom Project. We actually paid for a girl called Rebecca from the University of Sydney. Um, with, helped with her masters um, and she'll tell you a little bit about what she's done with a lot of our, our hair that's left over. My name is Rebecca Pagnico and I'm a student in the Master of Science at UTS. Typically to clean up oil spills you would be using synthetic products, things that are made from plastic fibres and recently there's been a big push towards using natural materials instead. As part of my master's degree, I'm working with Sustainable Salons Australia, looking at how hair can be used as a crude oil absorbent. It's exciting because we're taking something that is normally waste and giving it a beneficial second life. UTS has played a major role in shaping who I am today by giving me the practical experience, the exposure to industry, and the skills that I needed to succeed in my chosen field. So a normal hair boom, probably about one metre, um, it's now proven in our report that it, hair is 
one of, if not the best natural things for soaking up oil in an oil spill situation. Um, out of a one metre boom, we can actually extract uh, four litres of oil out of the ocean, and we can reuse three litres of that, which is amazing. People always ask, what do you do with the rest? Well, we obviously process it properly. We can return it to um, composting. And the main thing is we're just getting it out of the ocean, right? I know we had that disaster at the Mount uh, not too long ago. We were digging it up out of the sand, putting it in plastic bags that went to landfill. If we'd been able to stop it before it even got to the shore, uh, what an amazing thing that would have been. So they're already stockpiling these up the coast um, of, of Australia for situations like that. We wanted to show you how hair actually does react with oil. So this is um, salt water, exactly how it would be uh, in a natural environment. Um, we're just watching the, minute, the, the middle test there. What do you reckon, like two seconds? It's almost instant, exactly right. So we know this works, we now have the science behind it. Um, and yeah, this is just one thing that we're doing with the hair. There's a couple of other things we're working on. Composting's massive. 50% carbon. If you're a composting geek, that is awesome. Uh, high in amino acids and high in proteins. Looking around about 10% ratio of hair to your compost um, is, is about adequate. But again, we're, we're doing more of the science behind that. Um, and also insulation and bricks. Um, there's been tribes that have used it, human hair and animal hair, in the insulation of bricks, you know, and it really works. So we're playing with that um, at the moment as well too. So we're finding solutions for the 7.1 tonnes we're, we're stockpiling. We believe it's about to become a commodity, so who knows, one day maybe you might walk through Bunnings, pick up a hair boom for your oil spills at home when you're changing your oil, um, you know, or something like that. So stats from Australia. Um, this is what we've collected to date. So those stats are from uh, November 2017, um, we've done a lot more since then, that's why I gave you a couple of un updated stats there in my talk. Um, so profit, marketing, we do a lot around marketing. Um, it's important, it helps spread the message and it helps bring the consumer around to why the salon is doing what they're doing. Um, so we like to think we've got that right, um, the salons seem to love it. As I said we've gone from one salon in Australia to under, over 560 now under our program which is amazing, um, and in Auckland, just in a short amount of time, we've probably about 10 weeks, we've, gone to, we've got about 40 now in, in Auckland, we've moved into Hamilton too, so we're moving fast. We hope to be across the whole of New Zealand within three years, it's just me here at the moment. So we also produce a magazine called The Green Chair, it comes out quarterly, it's very much for our clients to read, but it's also for their clients to read. Just um, engaging stories about what we're doing with the waste, the types of things we're finding solutions for. Um, massive readership now, 390,000, just from being in the salon and lying around, which is great. Um, and I love seeing Bruce there. He's a I'm a big fan of his uh, on the front there. So um, this is more for the creative heads. If there are any stylists in the room, you'll love this. This is Sean McGrath. Sean McGrath um, won avant-garde hairstylist of the year in Australia this year. Um, he owns his own salon in Sydney, he's had four kids, he's again another one of those overachievers we love to love. Um, and uh, he actually won that award um, with wigs made out of salon waste pretty much from the floor. Um, so I think that's really cool and uh, I'll let you explain, him explain what sustainable salons means to him. A sustainable salon, for me, is someone who really gives a shit about the world around them. I'm Sean McGrath, this is Sustainable Salons. Here we recycle just about everything out of your local salon, so 
of salon waste is recyclable. Pretty much everything comes in here. We even have a category called weird stuff. Hairy, hairy Santa. This is the hair wall. Now, to date, we have collected 7.1 tonnes of hair from Australia's hair salons. This is a hair boom. These are deployed onto oceans when there's an oil spill. The hair soaks up the oil. Well, let's make a hair boom. This is a giant sack of hair. This is a pipe. This is a stocking. I'm just going to start stuffing it in. These have been stockpiled up on the Great Barrier Reef, saving the world with haircuts. When I decided that I was going to become a hairdresser, I was looking very much at the avant-garde and artistic side of hairdressing. This is a floral piece, but these flowers are all entirely made out of hair. This is just hair we've collected off the salon floor. If we can make something pretty out of stuff that everyone else is throwing out, that's such a good position to be in. TAFE New South Wales really helped me build up those sort of core skills that you need to become a hairdresser. And at night, once I get released from the kids and I'll go off to my shed and create the, the madness. What have I turned into art so far? I have used the interior of a Victorian house in London, slating off roofs, a bob out of safety pins, a lot of hair, garbage, metal, foil. There is really nothing that's off limits. Hey, we've even used cigarettes. I think there's this myth that artists are meant to be depressed and miserable um, to create wonderful things, but that's all the sort of bullshit which gets created with art theory. When I sit down with clients and tell them, this is what's happening to the hair, we just cut off your head. That one day might save the Great Barrier Reef from an oil spill. And if they don't get excited about this, I think there's something a little bit wrong with them. I tend to agree with them. Um, so, um, press. We've had a massive amount of press. Um, we, we haven't actually spent a cent on that. <laughs> Which, uh, it's such a, a great story, and um, <coughs> they really get behind us. You know, over 200 um, newspaper articles, along with uh, Channel 7 and probably about a dozen other stations in Australia picking up on the story. Um, it's a really good thing, and it's not hard to promote. Um, so we obviously started in hair care. Again, being able to order around about 50% of waste. Um, in three years, we've gone from 50 to 95%. So it's really good. We've almost ticked off salon waste being 100% sustainable. A lot of our salons under a program can actually be 100% sustainable. They just have to manage their own composting and the likes. And we do have salons doing that, which is really cool. We help educate that, and we do promote that within the salons. Um, Barbers started knocking on our doors not long after. Makes sense, right? Um, so we teamed up with, uh, in Australia, we recently teamed up with the world's greatest shave, and we collected all the hair. Um, we also generated $29,000 uh, through sustainable salons for that initiative too. So I think we were awarded the, the we, were the, we collected the most funds for New South Wales and Canberra. So pretty cool. Um, dog groomers, similar waste streams, um, where you'd be surprised um, they're actually not too different from salon spaces um, as far as the, the streams coming out. So we've taken them on board. And now Beauty too. I actually, funnily enough, had an orthodontist call me um, last month. So watch the space. Um, and obviously in medical, I've heard about the young guy here. I'd love to talk to him. Uh, medical grade waste is something we'll never touch and probably never go into. Um, but I'm starting to deal more and more with uh, medical beauty clinics. So we had our first come on, come on board here, um, Dr. Catherine Stone at the Face Place. She's a real advocate for us. And she's helping us find solutions every day for their waste because it's a little bit different to selling waste. Um, so yeah, that's our family at this stage. And um, yeah, basically, uh, we have a, a directory that you can go to uh, on our Sustainable Salons website, and we have 2,000 people a month coming there now actually looking for a sustainable salon to go to. So there's really power in that, um, and I'd urge you to do the same. Um, we do have a choice, and uh, yeah, thanks for listening, and I appreciate the time. Thank you.